Week one of the UN climate talks are drawing to a close in Durban, South Africa. Uh, we've been live with you on oneclimate.net all week, uh, and I just want to give you a few of the highlights before we wrap up here. Um, the, one of the top issues so far this week has been the Kyoto Protocol, the fate of the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, as you probably know, uh, that uh, is the only legally binding agreement on climate change that exists uh, currently, and uh, it's set to expire at the end of next year. Uh, many players here are interested in getting that protocol to be extended uh, into a second commitment period, but uh, there's been a lot of dis uh, dissension on that. Uh, the U.S. Uh, has never been a part of the Kyoto Protocol. It never ratified the treaty. Uh, Russia, Japan, uh, Canada are saying they're not going to be a part of a second commitment period. The EU is the key player here to see if the Kyoto Protocol will be extended and if the world's only legally binding climate uh, treaty will be extended and will continue to live on uh, beyond the end of next year. The question then is if the EU does agree to, to move forward with it, uh, with probably with a whole host of developing countries, would that be for a five-year period or an eight-year period? Uh, there's been some talk that uh, the Kyoto Protocol may be extended for eight years. Uh, campaigners here are saying that's too long, uh, that it's a treaty that is important to them, um, but uh, what they're looking for is something to ultimately move even beyond the Kyoto Protocol and to lock in uh, the 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 uh, what they're calling lower ambition uh, of of the Kyoto Protocol for eight years would be too long. They're looking for a five-year extension of the Kyoto Protocol. So we're going to see what happens with that next year. Uh, pardon me, next week. Um, the second big issue on the table next week will be the fate of a, a second, a separate long-term binding agreement that would cover all the world's countries uh, into, bring all the world's country into a binding agreement on climate change, on how to reduce emissions uh, over the long term. Uh, the small island states put forward a proposal earlier this week that would that would uh, mean that those negotiations would take place over the course of the next 12 months with the aim of getting an agreement uh, signed by the end of next year. Uh, the United States uh, has said that it is open to negotiating a new long-term binding agreement uh, in a sense to replace the Kyoto Protocol, but it's not interested in anything that would start before the year 2020. So while the small island states and the least developed countries are talking about within a year uh, having a new treaty being ready to uh, to be on the table. Uh, the United States is talking about a time frame more like eight years. Uh, the U.S. has also set down a, a series of preconditions before it would be, uh, enter into negotiations, uh, one of which is that all major emitters would be bound by this treaty. Uh, that's something that uh, has uh, not gone over so well uh, among some of the, the faster growing economies, the developing countries like China. Um, so there's some question as to uh, whether or not they'll be able to come to agreement on that. Uh, and there's been some, some dissension within the, the, the group of developing countries, uh, the G77 plus China, as to their positions on, uh, on negotiating a new long-term binding agreement that would include all the countries of the world. Uh, so we'll see if the G77 and China can come together with one solid negotiating position next week uh, and see if uh, how they're going to respond to the set of preconditions that the United States has put on uh, before negotiating a treaty. This this week, uh, many of the campaigners here uh, have said that it's it's unfair of the United States to put preconditions out, out there like this, that essentially they're negotiating the treaty uh, before they even sit down to negotiate the treaty. Uh, so we'll see how, how that develops next week as the ministers come to town and the high-level political negotiations play out. The third major issue here this week has been the, the fate of the Green Climate Fund. Uh, the Green Climate Fund is something that was uh, agreed to in principle last year uh, at the end of these talks one year ago in Cancun, Mexico. Uh, it's supposed to be a hundred billion uh, dollar per year fund. By the year 2020 they're going to have the idea is to have a hundred billion dollars per year in this fund that will help poor countries deal with the impacts of climate change and and also reduce their own emissions moving forward. Uh, so uh, that was agreed in principle at the end of last year. Uh, a working group worked all over the past year to, to, to create the, the mechanisms for that, exact, to, to figure out exactly how that would work. It was considered a very representative group. Uh, there were, I believe, 45 countries involved in that group, a majority of them developing countries. Uh, so there was uh, a good amount of um, of approval from activists and campaigners here uh, who follow these issues on, on the, the, the process for that. They were happy with uh, the, the, the mechanism for a fund that was put on the table here at the beginning for the most part. There were some, they did have some faults with it, but they believed it was a good enough fund to move forward with. Uh, the U.S. raised objections to the fund uh, and is trying to slow down the process now and, and, and send it back to the negotiating table. So uh, that ruffled some feathers here this week and we're going to see what happens over the course of the next week if, uh, if that fund actually is 
put into place? Uh, and if so, the next question then is, where does $100 billion per year come from? There have been a few innovative solutions put on the table this week, uh, including uh, attacks on shipping fuel uh, that some organizations, including WWF and Oxfam, have said could raise uh, up to $10 billion uh, per year for to, to start funding that fund. Uh, some have also talked about attacks on uh, airline fuel as well. Uh, that may that may be brought up next week, uh, and also attacks on financial transactions, what's being called the Robin Hood tax. Some have estimated that could raise up to 500 billion dollars uh, per year, uh, a massive amount by putting a tiny, tiny um, tax onto financial transactions, international financial transactions. That's something that's been bounced around for several years. Uh, campaigners uh, seem to be uh, pushing that issue a little bit more now. So we're going to see if uh, if any of those uh, ideas is for raising that money to help poor countries deal with the impacts of climate change. We'll see if any of those actually uh, come to fruition or get, get advanced a little bit uh, over the next week before we, we uh, wind down here uh, from Durban, South Africa. Today we were on the streets with the activists. Uh, they took to the streets. There were um, probably about 10,000 people out there. Uh, from all over Africa, from all over the world, calling for more urgency. That was really the the the, the singular call from from the from the activists out there. They want to see more urgency. They want the negotiators inside the halls here in Durban to remember what they're facing in their everyday lives and uh, to to take that with them when they go into the rooms to to negotiate the finer points of all these treaties. Uh, because they they don't understand why it's taken so long to come up with with an agreement. They want more urgency. They want more ambition. They say 2020 is too late for a treaty. Uh, they say that uh, the, the science demands that, uh, that the, the countries of the world reduce their emissions uh, by at least 40% uh, within the next uh, decade. Uh, they, 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 they reach that point. Um, and currently the pledges on the table only bring countries down about 20%. So they say the ambition isn't high enough, the urgency isn't there, that's what they want to see. Uh, next week, the ministers come to town, uh, we get into the really higher level political discussions. Uh, this week was much more about the, the sort of technocratic details, um, but next week is when I think a lot of the bigger decisions get punted uh, to next week. So the, the ministers will be in town, uh, they start to arrive on Monday, the fireworks start to go off then when the bigger issues get dealt with, and uh, we'll be with you all week on OneClimate.net, uh, so be sure to tune in. We've got the live blog going all week, uh, all, all day long as, as things come up, we'll be posting on the live blog, and of course we've got the, the live webcast every day as well. So uh, stay with us uh, all, all next week until uh, next Friday, probably into the, the early hours of Saturday morning, we'll be with you. To, to see what happens with the UN climate talks, the UN climate negotiations here in Durban, South Africa on oneclimate.net.